Whenever I talk to creationists about evolution, they often inform me that they have critically evaluated the process and determined that it couldn't have happened in the way scientists describe. And what do scientists know, right? The problem is that I've never met a creationist who can accurately describe how evolution works. To begin, they often have very little understanding of anatomy and physiology, although I have met some with quite a good understanding of these topics. They often don't know how mutations work, how natural or sexual selection works, how gene flow or genetic drift works, how speciation works, etc. These creationists are so often adults who fail to understand the process, and yet they want children to be able to decide for themselves whether or not to learn about evolution in the classroom. That's clearly unreasonable. So, I will spend this video explaining the underlying facts of biology that will allow us to tackle the first step of evolution in the next video. The first fact to investigate is that the concept of a living creature isn't static. Living is a description of the behavior of matter. On Earth, life needs water and food, interacts with the environment, reproduces, evolves, and happens to be carbon-based. On a different planet, life might be silicon-based, as is the focus of so many sci-fi novels. But whether life is based on carbon, silicon, germanium, or whatever else, the fact is that matter can still be considered living as long as it meets the series of criteria that describes life. That's why viruses aren't considered alive. They don't meet all the criteria. Maybe they're a remnant of the stage between non-life and life, or maybe they're just bits of genetic material that were captured by a simple membrane. Either way, they're neither quite alive nor quite the opposite. Rocks, on the other hand, aren't considered alive because they don't meet the criteria to be called living. Humans do. Plants do, mushrooms do, and bacteria do. Therefore, since all organisms share these characteristics, they must have arisen early in our evolution. Next, we must understand that life is very orderly. Atoms are arranged into molecules, molecules are arranged into macromolecules, macromolecules are arranged into organelles, which aren't considered alive, organelles comprise cells, cells comprise tissues, tissues comprise organs, and organs comprise organ systems. Our evolution was ground up, not magic down. Atoms easily form different molecules, like dihydrogen, methane, and cyanide, that can, again, easily give rise to macromolecules like proteins, lipids, carbohydrates, and nucleic acids. We also know from radioastronomical analyses of nebula and meteorites, like the Murchison meteorite, that amino acids, both left and right-handed ones, and nucleobases, like uracil, can easily form in nature. Laboratory experiments have also shown that cross-chiral strands of RNA can form with relative ease, meaning that the emergence of life, based originally on RNA, could happen without much difficulty. The point is that all the chemicals and reactions necessary to kickstart our evolution can and do happen naturally. The orderliness of our bodies and the ability of natural things to become more or less ordered have nothing to do with violating the second law of thermodynamics. And if you think they do, then it's fair to say you don't understand evolution, the second law of thermodynamics, or both. More complex structures have been observed evolving. For example, a type of flower called the slender clarkia underwent a genome duplication that allowed later generations to evolve a wider range of petal pigments, which would allow more insects to pollinate it than in generations prior to the genome duplication. People must also understand that evolution doesn't necessitate structures only getting more complex. Nowhere in the definition of evolution or the study of evolution does any evidence indicate that organisms only get more complex over time. Parasites, for instance, lose organs and functions as they become more specialized. That's still evolution. Which brings us to the definition of evolution. As I pointed out in earlier videos, biologic evolution is defined as genetic change in a population over time, or change in allele frequencies in a population over time. Either is correct. And how biologic evolution works has nothing to do with how the universe originated, how matter is synthesized from stars, or even how life started. The definition of biologic evolution includes the word population, meaning that there was already a population to begin with. Kent Hoven and others like him say the only way to study biologic evolution is to first understand how the universe and matter came into existence. But that's equivalent to saying you can't fix the engine of a car until you understand quantum mechanics first. It's totally ludicrous. And, for reference, an allele is a version of a gene. One example might be eye color. Let's say that there's only one gene for eye color. I don't know whether that's true or not. But this gene can be expressed as alleles that code for brown, blue, or green eye color. Individual organisms may pass on their genes throughout the generations, but evolution occurs on the level of populations, not individuals. This can't be stressed enough. And, evolution isn't metamorphosis like a tadpole becoming a frog. Next, evolution is described as a theory because it accounts for a wide range of observations, experiments, and inferences. But, evolution could also be a law in another sense. What I mean is that one of the criteria for being called living is that you evolve. 
All organisms evolve along with needing food, water, and space, responding to the environment and reproducing. So, the theory of evolution accounts for a vast array of phenomena and is our understanding of how evolution works, while the law of evolution simply states that organisms evolve over time. This is similar to the law and theory of gravity. The theory of gravity is the current understanding of how gravity works, based on numerous observations, experiments, and inferences, and the law of gravity is, bear with me, a particle attracts every other particle in the universe using a force that is directly proportional to the product of their masses and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between their centers. The theory of evolution also includes a number of laws within it. The law of segregation, the law of independent assortment, the law of monophyly, etc. The laws of segregation and independent assortment concern the arrangement of chromosomes during mitosis and meiosis and the law of monophyly states that organisms can't jump out of their specific lineage and into a distant one. For example, modern monkeys and chimps can't give birth to humans, as creationists expect, because that would mean somewhere along the line humans became part of the monkey or chimp lineage. Humans are descended from ancient monkeys, but not modern monkeys or chimps. And no, Dolo's law of irreversibility isn't a law, but a statement on the probabilistic likelihood of an evolutionary trajectory. So, with all these points out of the way, I think we're ready to jump into the process of evolution starting with mutations. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.